Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mike Force Podcast. It is your host, Mike G. Let's talk about the deep freeze this country is about to go through. So this is the coldest temperatures on record in years. Um, this thing or, uh, originated in Siberia and is making its way down into the northwest, the Pacific Northwest, and it's going to crush the U.S. I mean, there are highs in the negative 30 plus degrees or negative degrees, however you look at that, across the country. And this has been forecasted. But you are bound to see people who don't pay attention to this. And it is literally going to destroy a lot of communities and a lot of people's lives who aren't paying attention. I mean, the Weather Channel is very good at forecasting weather. But again, we will go down the rabbit hole here and talk about after the experience about how people weren't paying attention. Now, the biggest threat in these type of situations, especially where you see freezing temperatures in Florida, besides the iguanas falling asleep into coma and falling out of trees, what you're going to see is the debilitating effects on infrastructure, including the power grid. I remember in North Carolina, when I lived there, if there was a little bit of ice because the power lines and how they were built, they would collapse, they would fail. And then you'd go out of power guaranteed every single time it happened. So that's a problem. But most places infrastructure caters to the environment, to the seasons, to the norm, but this isn't norm. (laughs) This isn't anything close to normal for this time of year. And we're gonna see the after effects uh, what should you be pre- be prepared for? Uh, I was thinking about it in my own situation at this house. Here in Heber City, Utah, it's been cold. I don't remember the last couple of years it being this cold where I have to break ice on the steers. I have a steer in my front yard in my pasture. I have to break ice every single morning on his water. And I have to do that routinely throughout the day because as soon as I break ice, it refreezes Because even the sun at 5,000 plus feet isn't enough heat to melt the, the ice on the surface and to prevent it from refreezing. So a whole bunch of dilemmas that are going on. But what I'm in fear of is what happens if I lose power in the house. Now, a lot of people say you, you have a generator in this house. I actually don't have a generator. My last house, I have a generator. I'm on a waiting list uh, or, or a waiting term to get my stuff installed, but that's going to take months. So I want a 17 kilowatt Generac hooked up with propane and a 500 gallon propane tank that I have on site. I don't want the propane tank being connected um, to a line um, that's coming from somewhere else, natural gas wise. I want to have a reserve on hand and then have the line. Like right now, my propane which just kicked on my heater, provides um, propane gas, natural gas to my um, stoves, to my heating tanks for my hot water, to my heater in the house, and to my fireplace. That's connected through infrastructure. If that fails because the power shuts down, man, I want to be able to have the power standalone. So I thought about it uh, last night. It, It got real cold, and I had to turn up the heater, If I lost power, I actually have a Scout camper and a diesel heater that I could use to heat uh, a space. My Scout camper, like the the actual RV Scout camper, where I could put my kids in that to keep them warm. I mean, I have enough stuff here, blankets, sleeping bags. I could start a physical fire with logs inside of my propane gas fireplace. But man, thinking about these things now... When this storm is moving in to parts of the country that will break the infrastructure or elderly and young people who are living in poverty aren't thinking about these things is going to cause the loss of life. I told you guys about the power loss in 2003 where 45 million people lost power and 100 people died. 100 people, mostly elderly, died. Guys, I just did a... um, Anyway, sorry, that storm is coming through here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in anticipation for a very cold, wintry blast of Arctic air and precipitation uh, here on Thursday, 
most of the country Thursday, Friday, Saturday, leaving, leading into to actual Christmas. Uh, please take precaution. Uh, I just did a preparedness seminar in Heber City, Utah, with about 90 people who showed up. Amazing opportunity to talk to my community. About half the people that showed up were there from the local community in Salt Lake City. And there were people from out of town. Uh, you had people from Nevada. You had people from Denver, Colorado. A young man from Denver came in. And it's really cool doing those type of engagements because that's important for people to come together. We will continue to do those engagements into the new year. And I just got off the phone with my team. We will be bringing firearms to the area. So we will have firearms being sold in Heber City, Utah at Philcraft HQ. All the firearms that we talk about. Um, I want to clarify something because I, I, I've had this feedback recently. Uh, I talked to Kyle Lamb about this this morning. And, and let me be very, be very clear about this. I have never advocated for Full Metal Jacket as being the end-all, be-all solution for the rounds that you carry in your firearms. I said it's a consideration. It's what I do depending on... Um, it's what I use depending on what I'm doing, especially if I'm in and around vehicles, right? Because I talked about the considerations of Full Metal Jacket and its placement through and on obstacles to include tempered glass, uh, vehicles, uh, obstacles that you encounter throughout the world. But I also said in the same token that I'm using Hornady uh, self-protection synthetic, synthetic bonded ammunition for my home defense uh, gun, a 124 grain home defense ammo or self-defense ammo because likely I'm going to encounter a person and I have hollow core doors. So all of these people who talk in the tactical space, who have opinions, that's just a natural thing that's going to happen. Guys have opinions, especially the egos that have very strong opinions. But here's what I'll warn you. A guy's narrow experience in special operations is not the end-all, be-all solution to the expertise in tactics, nor training. I mean, as a Green Beret, my job was to train for an internal defense. I've probably trained more people than in most professions and special operations because that's one of our, out of the seven mission sets that we have now, that's profoundly the main one that the Green Berets are known for. I've trained indigenous forces all across the world as my profession, right? Counterterrorism, foreign internal defense by, with, and through, training them and then combat advising them by entering the breach point with them. Uh, that's what I've done my entire military career. With that being said, don't let anybody tell you that there's an end-all, be-all solution to anything because it's not true. You can have your opinion and you can feel strong about your opinion, but the idea that there's one way to skin a cat, especially in tactics, that's wrong, guys. Don't, don't ever buy into that. And if somebody says it and they're toxic, just walk away. As a consumer, you have the great choice that is the free will you have in America with more options than any place in the world to just walk away. Doesn't, doesn't that just break your heart about this world that we live in? Like, God, out of all the things that we're doing right now, focused on infighting, focused on talking crap, it's like, man, we should probably get and collaborate and do positive things together. Enough about that. I just want to put that out there. I think um, guys like Kyle Lamb, who are, are good friends of mine, who I talk to often about the tactical space and all the toxicity, he's sick of it. We're sick of it. And what we have to do is understand that people are going to be the way they are. They've always been that way, by the way. And we need to move forward and have good conversations and be positive. Help each other out. I mean, help educate me. If you think uh, there's better ways to do it, have the conversation with me. Um, but the idea of t attacking each other, I'm not on that uh, train and that bandwagon. If you do it, by the way, I just block and delete you and, and, and block and delete you from my life. Not just my social media account, but from my life. Like, I'm, I'm not interested in having the conversation with you um, ever, by the way, because I got a lot of things going on. Changing my daughter's diaper is more important than entertaining that conversation with you. Um, 
let's talk about uh, training protocols for you in 2023. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in the preparedness seminar in training was you shouldn't just isolate your game of preparedness in one genre of preparedness. A lot of guys, for example, just want to do self-defense training or tactical training because they think it's cool. I mean, that's the bottom line. They think it's the most necessary. A guy in the preparedness seminar, which is, I'm bringing this up because I get, a, I get asked a lot of good questions during these preparedness seminars. A guy asked me, Mike, I've kind of done all the training courses. What else is there? And I said, well, what training courses did you do? And he said, well, I did all the self-defense ones. I've, I've trained with Philcraft. I've trained with uh, a Warrior Poet Society. I've done all these tactical training courses. And I said, have you ever done physical combatives training? And he said, no, I haven't. I said, well, if you understand how to operate with a tool, which a knife, a gun, uh, you know, a, a taser, mace, all these things are tools in an escalation of force and self-defense. They're just tools. So now you're, that you're the expert at the tool, are you an expert at you, your physical body? Like if somebody grabbed you, that would likely be the confrontation before somebody pulls a gun on you. Do you know how to um, physically deal with somebody? Do you, do you know how to physically um, stop somebody from attacking you? Do you know jujitsu? Do you know how to pass their guard and get in a dominating position, top mounted, to stop them from attacking you and to, um, and to win the upper hand? If you don't and you've never been in, in a situation where somebody, a third of the body weight of you, uh, a hundred pound kid can pretzel roll you because of technique, if you've never experienced that, you should. And it starts as a baseline with combatives and jujitsu. As a lifestyle in special operations, in the military period, we go through these constant protocols of combatives. Whether it's MMA based, whether it's lines training that the Marine Corps started, whether it's um, uh, Greg Thompson and Mac, um, it's called the uh, SOC P, Special Operations Combatives Program. Whatever that is, it's part of the lifestyle. So being used to being physically handled and then having a plan of attack, how to navigate uh, your own body and your own mind where you want to get crazy. You, you start contracting your body, you, you get elevated in your heart rate, and the more excited you get, the more you're going to get choked out. That understanding of your capability in physical confrontation is likely more important statistically than how to use a tool in self-defense. So the baseline foundation here is how to deal with physical confrontation. Um, there are protocols. Before that, and tactics to mitigate risk, to reduce your chances of physical confrontation. Jocko, as a point of reference, talks about it a lot, where if he's in a physical confrontation, he has said openly, he'll just run away. Because why would he risk the lawsuit um, hurting somebody? All the things that you have to deal with in a physical confrontation because of emotion, because of ego. That's the first step in preparedness is reducing the chances in the first place because you're smart and intelligent. Situational awareness, decision making, all of those things you do before the worst case scenario. So foundationally, um, having that understanding is important. We offer decision point. We offer, uh, I have a self-protection course that's a self, uh, or sorry, personal security course that I'm offering January 14th in Heber City. We just put that on the calendar. It's available right now. You can go on the website. I, I might even have a link for it below. But um, I'm bringing Leah Stump, Andy Stump's a, a wife who is an expert at training people in how to physically handle confrontations, both in mind and body. She's going to be teaching Phil Craft survival courses, both in Kalispell, Montana, and throughout the United States on this very subject matter. I look forward to that. In fact, uh, the program 62 that Amber's released, that's a 12-week academic program, she will be te teaching a block of instruction on just that for family preparedness. And you guys can go that, uh, to the website and find that. Um, let's talk about my EDC setup because I was asked off off camera um, in, on my Patreon account. 
um, hey, Mike, let's talk about your specific EDC and how it's changed for the wintertime and why. I carry a 365 macro pistol. I carry that gun inside the waistband and also inside of a fanny pack. I carry a tourniquet from North American Rescue or TAC Med Solutions, the, the soft TY, depending on what I'm doing. But I carry that tourniquet every single day. I have kids. I want them to be protected. And if I'm, if I'm carrying just one on my person, that's for the immediate response, but I have an aid bag in my vehicle with more than just one, right? I have the mass casualty or the ability to treat my family and the first aid kit inside my vehicle. Also, on person, I carry a Surefire flashlight. Um, I don't tether it to my gun just because of my EDC setup. And most often, you won't find me outside after dark because I have to bathe my kids, feed my kids, and put my kids to bed. And I'm a father. And I don't like being out late at night. That's where most bad things happen. I also carry a BCK, a bleeding control kit uh, by Philcraft Survival that has all the things to stop a bleed. Now, a lot of people would, would think that's a lot. But for me, inside of a fanny pack, I'm, I, we apologize about not having that in stock. It will be in stock in a couple of weeks. But having that on person in a fanny pack is a minimal um, requirement, I think, for everybody in everyday carry, summer, winter, name the season. What I added to my kit in the wintertime is both a lighter and a Mylar space blanket. Look, a Mylar space blanket that allows you to insulate your body temperature and maintain your core body temperature, temperature and your heat is critical in a life-saving situation where the difference between life or death and exposure to the elements means what you have on person because your clothes aren't good enough. So if you're able to wrap a Mylar space blanket, which folds neatly like this big, and do the walk um, and, and elevate your heart rate, that's going to keep you warm enough to survive. A big lighter to start the fire, man, mission essential. Like if you don't have the ability in a flame to spark a, to, to ignite a flame of fire to keep your core body temperature warm or to signal where you are in the wintertime, man, you better have that on hand. You better have that on hand. Um, let's talk a little bit about headline news. I like talking about headline news because um, it's relevant to you guys, and I also like checking it in real time, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, let's check CNN and the headlines and, and what's going on. So I like going to both news channels on both the left and the right. As a, as a registered independent of this country, um, I see what propaganda each side's trying to push. So kind of you'll find the truth somewhere in the middle. And the headline on CNN is January 6th panel to unveil criminal referrals against Trump. Now, why do you think that's happening? Well, you could probably guess why. I mean, if he's already stated that he's running, then that's going to be part of the conversation and trying to get him not to run. Um, I'd like to see DeSantis run personally. Um, but I did vote for Trump. Uh, when he ran for president against Hillary Clinton because I'm not a big fan of the Clintons. Um, other headline news. Um, wow, it's all about Trump on the headline news. Um, all about Trump. All right, let's talk about this bomb cyclone headed for the Northeast because this they're now c calling the bomb cyclone. I'll give you the recent update because uh, I read about this last night and a lot has changed. It's the coldest air of the season. And temperatures were dropped so low in some places that frostbite could begin in as little as five minutes to expose, expose skin. We're looking at zero to negative 15 degrees, common from eastern Washington to the upper Mississippi Valley. Also, um, daytime lows on Tuesday dip as low as negative 20 to negative 30 in parts of Montana. Good luck to Andy Stump and Kalispell. Actually, he'll be here tomorrow. Me and him and uh, Evan Hafer are uh, recording a podcast for the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, so he'll be in town. Um, the updates as it goes is late into Saturday, but then tapers off. Uh, that's the latest update on that. Let me go to Fox News live with you on the podcast as well. So 
the the number one story is how the Justice Department allegedly targeted top news social media executives after Hunter Biden revelations. Okay, so it's a political war. Where do you go? Where do you go for sound news? If you're listening to this, I want to know. Where do you go for trusted news? Leave your comments and feedback below. If you're listening to this on the on the podcast, make sure you go to YouTube and subscribe because this is the Mike Force podcast. Make sure you uh, leave in the comments where you go for trusted news sources. I'd like to know because I can't find it. Um, a gunman opens fire on condo board, killing five in second such shooting in a week. A Toronto area condo board meeting turned tragic Sunday when a gunman stormed in and killed five people before uh, being fatally shot by police. Uh, police say residents were evacuated from the building. Too bad you can't self-protect yourself um, because you can't be armed in Canada as a private citizen, which is a shame, which is a dang shame. We live in a society now, right, where uh, the idea of self-protection used to be outsourced to the police. I mean, we have a relationship and agreement between us and institutions that you're going to help me because I outsource my education, my health care, and now my security. But when we know when shit hits the fan, it's too late. There's not enough time to get people to respond. I want to end this podcast and talking about this Netflix series about, it's not a series, sorry, it's a Netflix uh, documentary about the 2019 uh, New Zealand volcano explosion. Um, I say explosion, it erupted but it was a temporary eruption where you had steam coming out of the center of that volcano. And as that took place, uh, 22 people were tragically killed. Two bodies never recovered. In the story on Netflix, it fails to mention one of the most significant parts of that documentary, which is private citizens are the ones who rescued over a dozen people who were trapped on that island by themselves with no help from the government. Why? Because somebody at a political level decided it was too dangerous from their cozy seat in their cubicle. They told the first responders it was too dangerous for you to deploy into harm's way. Even though you're a first responder, that's your job, but it's too dangerous. So we're not allow allowing any first responders to go in. So this gentleman, and I don't want to say the names, you guys could look this up yourself. I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want to get sued by Netflix. The gentleman who owns a private helicopter business tells his guys to load helicopters, we're going in. And they go save and rescue over a dozen innocent people who are trapped on the island. And if they weren't rescued at the time in which they were rescued, they would have likely all perished. Now, many of them did because they suffered burns over 70, 80, 90% of their bodies. So they go in, realize they are it. They pick up guys in their private helicopters times three private helicopters, and they leave. Here's the catch. They get sued or fined. Is not sued. They get fined by the government of New Zealand. In excess, I believe, of 1.4, the equivalent of $1.4 million, they get sued. Charged and sued. Uh, I'm sorry, fined. The guy who actually led the rescue operation is a former New Zealand SAS guy, Special Air Service. Now, most of the British um, countries, um, this includes uh, the Eastern or the European countries, as well as Australia, South Africa, have their own version of their Special Air Service, the SAS, an elite special operations counterterrorism organization. They went to conduct this rescue, and they get fined after rescuing people when the government wouldn't step in and help. So what does that tell us? Like Greg Anderson says, no one's coming to save you. Save yourself. Save yourself. Um, lastly, you saw me do this update on this chat GPT, this AI, this artificial intelligence that writes scripts based on the question that you answer it. A lot of good feedback. I appreciate all the comments that you guys left. It is scary to think about how this works because it, as this evolves or de-evolves our society, what are we left with? Half of you are being controlled in this country by an algorithm. Like, if you've ever asked yourself when you come home and you're angry and you don't know why, 
You're infuriated. You're losing sleep. You're yelling at your kids unnecessarily. You're burning down your personal relationships. Why are you so emotional? And if the question of you putting your phone down and all your problems go away, then you have the answer. It's all right here. Like it's, it's so bizarre to me that I get kids sliding in my DMs, commenting, so outraged at the world, so emotional, no control, so emotional. And I'm like, why are you so mad? Well, I read that you, that's the first problem. You just described inherently the problem with society and you personally, you read. So you read something online, you think it's truth, now you're emotionally charged and angry. How weak and frail of a society are we that this and the purpose of it, controlling your emotions, we're allowing that to happen as people. And the more emotionally charged you are, because you buy into it, because you spend four hours a day on your social media platform. People have asked, well, Mike, you spend a lot of time on social. I don't spend a lot of time on social. Live, I'll tell you how much right now I have on social. The average time I have per day, per day, on social, on Instagram, I'll give you, for example, Instagram, because Zoom, I have 49 minutes, Messages, 42 minutes, Safari, 14 minutes, Twitter, two minutes, Instagram, 14 minutes. That's day. So let's go to the average per week. On average, I spend per week on Instagram an hour and 29 minutes per week. That's over a seven-day period. How is that possible, Mike? Well, it's possible because a lot of my behavior is spent on YouTube because I like YouTube. I'm curious as a human being. But I go in and try to positively influence Like Instagram isn't a thing for me anymore because I go in and try to positively influence and I don't have the time to scroll and click just in my own behavior and my lifestyle of taking care of my kids and everything else that's going on in the world. But I I don't spend a lot of time on social media, period, because there's so many more better influential things that we could do for each other. Podcast, don't even ask how many hours I have of, of listening to podcasts. It's it's like a day's worth of podcast because everywhere I go where there's, where there's nothing to do except maybe potentially listen, I'm getting informative podcast from people that I like. Um, Sean Ryan. Um, uh, <laughs> I just drew a complete blank. Like, that's it. Sean Ryan. Um, Sean Ryan. Uh, the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Listening to Kevin Reeves inter- interviewing people. Uh, ben Shapiro. I like, and Dan Bongino. I like those guys. Um, that's about it. That's all I got. Jack Carr's podcast. He's, he's awesome, especially with the history stuff. So change your behaviors. Don't so, don't be so emotionally charged when it comes to these things guys be safe. It's the beginning of the week. Let's kick ass together this week. Leave your comments, subscribe, hit the notification tab. I love you. I appreciate you guys Head into the holiday. Be safe out there, especially uh, leading into uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas. I'll have one po- more podcast this week for you by the end of the week. Um, I, I appreciate you guys. Without your support, I couldn't do what I do. And, and thank you so much for it. Till next time. Peace out, guys.